So we've established that cognitive science seeks to bring together insights from very many disciplines and to try to make sense of them collectively in the full knowledge that the concepts and terms employed and assumed by one field may not work within another field. So we don't, for example, necessarily know what we mean by the word mind, but that word has a history. And we can follow that in the history of philosophy. The dedicated area, the philosophy of mind, is very, very old, though it hasn't always gone by that name. So if we follow philosophy back as far as we can, and we look in philosophy in other traditions, there are certain questions which consistently recur, and they have often been discussed using words like soul, but there are other terms like spirit, and we could go further afield, <clears throat> that revolve around trying to make sense of our experience of being conscious beings in the world. We're going to only trace <clears throat> the last few hundred years of this, um, but as we do so, a, a, a persistent opposition comes into view, which is much older. This goes back to before the time of Plato. Um, and the opposition in question has come to be known as that between rationalism and empiricism. Now, we said at the start that cognition is going to be very hard to pin down, and we won't have a satisfactory definition. But our, the central concern here is knowing. The manner in which one interprets the word knowing differs, and one can emphasize some aspects of knowledge over others. And that's what is made evident in this contrast between rationalist concerns and empirical concerns. Empirical concerns have to do with the senses and with experience, lived experience and direct observation. Rational concerns have to do with the use of reason and logic and abstraction away from any embodied present. Um, when we use these labels carelessly, it can sound like we've got two football teams, the red team and the blue team, and one must be right. That's not the right way to view this. Um, rather, these are different sets of concerns that will influence how you then go about developing a theory of what knowledge is. So let's just put them side by side here. Um, empirical concerns, as we said, have to do with direct experience, lived experience, and observation. And science is, of course, robustly empirical, because science starts with observation. Science without any connection to measurement and direct observation is not science. But those of us who work in the field of science knows that, know that such knowledge is somewhat uncertain. And those of us with senses know that the senses don't explain themselves. And so um, the kind of knowledge that is discussed in an, with, when we emphasize empiricist concerns is somewhat uncertain and can always be changed, altered by new experiences of the world. Mathematics is a little bit odd here because mathematical objects like numbers and sets and mathematical procedures are very abstract. And it's unclear why the elements that feature in mathematical theory work so well when we're dealing with a physical world. So mathematics is itself not an empirical discipline, um, but is used to make sense of observations. Now, rationalist concerns are equally old, one can emphasize certainty and the use of reason. Reason has long, long, long been held as a hallmark of humans, as uh, something that sets them apart from animals. That is not a position everyone agrees with, but it has uh, featured in this way largely in 2,000 years of discussion and more. Um, reason and the associated business of uh, logic, which can be formalized. 
we inherit this from, in our case, from Aristotle and the Greeks. Um, logic, reason, and mathematics have kind of gone together. And mathematics has provided the uh, best example of the kind of knowledge that seems to be certain. It seems like, yes, I may not know, for example, what's outside my front door. I may expect that there's no elephants outside my front door. And one day I may go outside and find an elephant outside my front door and I'll be surprised. But I will never go outside and find a four-sided triangle. That is just not going to happen. And I will never go outside and find a triangle in the planar surface whose angles add up to more or less than 180 degrees. Those are mathematical truths and they are not going to be shifted by new observation. So rationalist concerns have to do with the certainty of knowledge and they tend to downplay the senses uh, because it, it doesn't provide this, the information gained through the senses does not provide absolutely secure ways of knowing. Um, so there's plenty of room for disagreement here as one balances both sets of concerns. Um, and you can see that we're going to get into the territory where people spend most of their time arguing, which is what is true knowledge. Um, so we're going to first look at uh, rationalist concerns because they um, emerge very strongly with this figure, René Descartes, who lived in the first half of the 17th century. A fantastic hair, didn't he? And um, Descartes was a polymath, as we would say in these days. He was a genius in lots and lots of ways. You know, learned Cartesian coordinates and mathematics in school, for example, which was a very important contribution that he gave us. He was a philosopher as well as a mathematician. And he's going to be our key landmark when we speak of rationalism. For his philosophical writings um, introduced a way of laying things out that is both problematic and difficult to get beyond. So Descartes, being the kind of um, intellectual that he was, uh, thought that true knowledge should be certain knowledge, and he wanted to find the basis for that. He wanted to know how can we know anything for sure, for sure, for sure. Now, He'd been around for a while, so he knew, for example, about optical illusions. I hope that optical illusion is working for you there. Nothing is moving on your screen, and yet things appear to be moving. So the senses are providing, I say nothing is moving on your screen, and yet you see something moving. So the senses seem to be un untrustworthy here. And as well as optical illusions, we've got the... We've got to experience in our own lives of things like hallucinations, altered states of consciousness, dreams, and plain old mistakes. Um, so the senses don't provide the kind of certainty that Descartes was looking for. So Descartes lays out in a series of little <clears throat> books called the Meditations, he lays out a very cogent argument, which insists that some knowledge must be certain, but he emphasizes that this is not going to be knowledge obtained through the senses. And so he adopts a position, for argumentative purposes, of a skeptic. He says, what if, what if I was just mistaken? What if I was wrong? What could I not be wrong in? Is there anything I could not be wrong in? So he's trying to reason his way into some indubitable statement that will provide him with a basis on which he can build. The story is very complicated. One way to understand what Descartes was doing was to clear a space for the practice of science so that theology wouldn't get in the way, for example. Um, he was also at the same time <clears throat> providing some very bad proofs for the existence of God. But that needn't concern us. Let's have a look at his skepticism. One thing you can say about Descartes, he was writing in the 17th century, but he writes in a very clear manner. He can still be read today. You could read him and you could understand him. So let's just read here his skepticism at work. Suppose for the sake of argument, I've convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world. No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too don't exist? No, if I convince myself of something, then I certainly existed. 
But suppose there's a deceiver of supreme power and cunning, a really evil one, who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. In that case, I too undoubtedly exist. If he is deceiving me, and let him deceive me as much as he can, he will never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I think that I am something. So, after considering everything very thoroughly, I finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. This is the text from the second meditation, where he introduces this notion of I am, I exist, as the one thing that he cannot doubt. In his later writings, this is repeated, the argument has gone over several times, and this becomes the catchphrase, possibly the most best-known phrase from the whole of philosophy, I think, therefore I am, or in Latin, cogito ergo sum. This is where it first appears. He's simply asserting that even if he's deluded, there, the fact that he's deluded means there's someone to be deluded. And notice he doesn't say that his I that he's asserting here, is continuous in time. He says it is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. Now that's a lot of work to state what most of you think is probably the blindingly obvious. This, however, has been a central problem, raises very clearly a central problem that we have never got away from in the 350 years since. I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. And is that therefore? He's, this is going to be the foundation for the entire metaphysical and scientific picture that Descartes will develop. His love of the abstract and his uh, devotion to reason is very evident when we see here the further the mind is taken away from its proper object, logic and pure reason, the more likely it is to fall into error. So Descartes thinks that the mind has proper objects, which are logic and reason. So he's carving things up and reifying the mind in a very particular way. He says the purpose of philosophy is to direct the mind away from the confusing images of the senses, that's his skepticism, towards the indubitable truths contained within the mind itself. Notice this is not the first time in this course already that we've met this notion of something being indubitable, something you cannot doubt. But here it's not the physical at all. It's the certainty that the thinker exists. On the basis of this speculation, Descartes develops a metaphysical picture that is troubling, that we must repudiate, but it is deeply baked into our language. He concluded that mind was something completely distinct from matter. In the philosophical terms of the day, what you would say is they are two different substances. But the word substance here should not be taken in our contemporary sense of something like wood or fabric. Um, it means something which has an essence of some sort. And the kind of essence that the mind has is very different from the kind of essence that matter has. Mind, for Descartes, is invisible, without dimensions, immaterial, unchanging, indivisible, and without limit. That's a lot of claims for the mind. So what Descartes has done is he's chosen to draw a line, a wedge, through nature that divides everything into two distinct sorts of being, the mental and the physical. How they interact then becomes for Descartes a problem, and a problem he never solved, and nobody has ever solved it since, because the way it's set up is problematic. That the mental must interact with the physical is very obvious, because if I will my hands to pick up a pen, and then my hand goes and picks up the pen, then my mental intention, the idea I conceived that I might pick up the, the pen, turned into a, a will to pick up the pen, and lo and behold, there's the pen moving. And it's not moving in a mechanical sense, it's being 
forced around in the air by me. So somehow this mental stuff and this physical stuff must interact. And remember, in Newton's mechanical universe, there's only the physical, spatially extended stuff. There's only massive bodies. So Newton didn't have this problem because Newton didn't have mind in his cosmology. Descartes made a wild guess. There was a gland at the base of the brain called the pineal gland, as you can see there in the figure. He didn't know too much about it. Nobody knew much about the pineal gland at that stage. It's a bit odd because it's on the midline of the body, and most organs of the body are paired. And this one sits right in the middle. And Descartes thought, that's where the magic happens. That's where the mental and the physical sort of meet, and someday we'll understand that. He was wrong. We now have a much better idea of what the pineal gland is and does. It's a very important little gland doing gland-like things. Um, but what it's not doing is acting as a magic point at which the realm of the mental meets the realm of the physical. So we'll have a little more on Descartes in the next video.